So our work is mainly about uh, to pursue the work of journalists who cannot work in their own countries because of the threats and risks there. Maybe they're afraid of uh, uh, prosecution, and therefore all journalists who who are afraid of the prosecution, we want to uh, help them and pursue their work on their behalf. I wanted uh, my uh, presentation to be in Arabic, but uh, I need to mo uh, practice more. This year is going to be in English, but next year it's going to be in Arabic. Uh, I would like to present you Forbidden Stories. Uh, Forbidden Stories is uh, a network, a collaborative network uh, of journalists, investigative journalists devoted to pursue the investigations of journalists uh, who cannot anymore, who have been silenced because they are threatened or they are uh, arrested, sometimes killed. So this is really our main goal. Um, the network was created uh, almost three years ago um, and by Laurent Richard, who is a quite an important investigative journalist in France. And actually, I would like to start with something important, what we are not, <laughs> because there is a bit of confusion, so I want to make things clear uh, right now. Many people ask me if we were doing advocacy or uh, legal uh, counseling, and we're not doing this, actually. Uh, it's important for you to know that we are a network of journalists and we uh, use journalism to defend journalists uh, all around the world. This means we are working on stories. Um, we are not doing the work or, of Reporters Sans Frontières, Reporters uh, Without Borders, or the committee uh, CPG, Committee for Protection of Journalists. So we really uh, finish the investigations. We're not providing um, bullet bulletproof jackets, <laughs> so uh, we, we think that when a journalist is arrested or uh, killed or threatened um, somewhere, uh, it's because he was working on a big story, an important story, and this story deserves to be published, edited, and put on the public uh, space. And this is really what we do and what has inspired uh, Laurent Richard uh, when he created this, uh, this network of journalists. Um, Perhaps the first project we work on is important to explain. It was called the Daphne Project, um, from the name of Daphne Caruana Galizia. I don't know if you heard uh, about her. Actually, there are some news in Malta right now, so perhaps if you follow the news, you might have heard her name. She's a Maltese journalist, and she was killed in the explosion of uh, her car two years ago. And it has shaken public opinion, actually, in Europe, because it was in the middle of Europe. And she was doing uh, investigative work and she was writing a lot about local politicians and, and national politicians in Malta and corruption stories. So uh, her death arrived two months after uh, the network was created and it was logical that we really focused on this story to start with. And we had actually two goals when we started working on, on the Daphne project. It was really try to identify the murderers and also to pursue her investigations. Um, so to work on this, <coughs> we managed to gather 45 journalists all around the world, uh, from Le Monde, The Guardian, New York Times was, was uh, also uh, in this uh, project. Uh, we had El País, uh, we had um, Expresso from Portugal, many important newspapers, <coughs> 18 organizations. Uh, we worked for five months, and it was a, yeah, a big collaborative uh, program to start with. So we divided our work. We decided to focus on different parts of investigation Daphne was working on. <coughs> for example, she was working on Maltese passports. So this is a part uh, we focused on with four or five journalists of the team. She was working on a bank called Pilatus, and it's a part uh, we investigated as well. As well. We, she was uh, working on... Um, a company called 17 Black, and this is very interesting. I don't know if Stephen Gray from Reuters is here, but Stephen Gray, uh, who is in Irish, was uh, working in this team on 17 Black, and 17 Black is a company Daphne identified through the Panama Papers. And actually, she, dis she discovered that 17 Black, an offshore company, of course, um, was going to pay bribes um, to politicians, actually, 
two mm, very important figures in Malta, uh, the chief of cabinet of the prime minister and the minister of energy, who is today the minister of tourism. So she knew that this company, offshore company, was going to pay bribes to politicians. And she died before uh, knowing who was behind this company. And actually, this is what our group tried to identify with Stephen Gray and um, uh, Jacob from uh, Times of Malta. They dedicated a lot of resources in this, and they finally discovered that uh, the guy behind Seventeen Black was a guy named Jorgen Fenech. I don't know if you heard that, uh, that name, but this guy was actually arrested <coughs> three days ago or a little more, four days ago. He was trying to escape on his yacht, <laughs> and so the police was tracking his yacht, has been tracking his yacht for a while, and so um, they took him back to Malta, and he's now in prison. And he's actually, it's very interesting to follow what's happening in Malta right now, because uh, there is something new every day, or two or three new stories every day. But uh, this guy demanded pardon, so he, tell, he told the police, I'm going to give you all the names if I have pardon. I don't know uh, what he's going to tell the police, but it's really very interesting to see that actually one year ago when we did this investigation and when we published the story, Jürgen Fenech was at the center of um, our investigations. And what was the intuition of, of the Daphne project was that investigating um, Daphne murder and investigating her stories was perhaps going, I mean, it was very interconnected. And I think uh, what's happening now, uh, I mean, showing that this intuition was um, quite right. And yeah, we will do a following on the Daphne project uh, after uh, finding, I mean, after seeing what's happening there. And uh, it's prob probable that um, some political changing changes will, will uh, also happen in, in Malta. Yeah, this was the recent, I mean, these were taken yesterday evening, but I guess uh, yeah, Jürgen Fenix rearrested because he was released on bail and then he rearrested. Re and uh, there is a mul this Maltese businessman seeks pardon. So this is, these are very, very recent developments of the story. Um, it's important to know that this idea of uh, collaborating to pursue the investigations of journalists is not new. And Laurent had an inspiration, actually. It was the Arizona Project. Is, uh, I don't know if you heard of, of it. I, I didn't before uh, working for Forbidden Stories. The story dates back to 1976. And um, actually, it was Don Bowles was a reporter in Arizona, Phoenix, and he was investigating corruptions and, and land fraud. And he was killed in a car explosion as well. So. After his death, 38 journalists from 28 newspapers and, and television stations decided to take over his work and pursue the investigations. And like the Daphne project, this investigation lasted for months. And at the end of the investigation, there was a um, uh, um, common editions of in the different newspaper. And many politicians, especially one senator, was at the key of the investigation. The idea of uh, collaborating together to pursue the work of journalists who are silenced is actually something quite logical for us. Um, we, I don't know if you attended yesterday the panel on collaborative journalists with the ICIG. It was a very interesting panel. And one of the first thing, uh, Marina Walker, from the ICIG said is that um, actually collaboration is very important for the sake of the, of the story, because the story is important. And in our cases, we really think that the story uh, is huge because somebody was killed or arrested for it. So we, we think that, yeah, collaborative journalist and deciding to put your ego on the side apart is really important in that case. It also uh, obliges you to be very um, precise, to do more fact-checking when you work with people from all around the world that have different standards of journalism. You have, you know, to uh, apply the most, uh, 
yeah, the, the most re difficult stand, I mean, the um, plus exigeant, <laughs> uh, the highest standard. So for us, it's very important to see how journalists are working all over the world and to apply the, the highest uh, methods. I think it's important also to collaborate in those cases because collabor collaboration uh, makes you stronger. Actually, when you are alone, um, facing uh, big businesses, facing corrupted politicians, uh, it's very difficult to have all this pressure when you're writing uh, for a local newspaper or uh, doing uh, freelance work. But we, when you are 10 or 20 or 30 journalists uh, coming and asking, uh, I mean, prime ministers, uh, big, uh, uh, big firms questions, they cannot say no. And, and you feel more protected because you, you are together. And <laughs> So this, uh, this is also the, the reason why we decided that the best way to, to finish those stories was to create this platform. We also think it gives us more impact because the principle of collaboration is that you work together for four or five months, some, sometimes more, in secrecy, so you don't uh, get public about what you're doing, but then everybody publishes uh, the, the story at the same time. It's exactly like the Panama Papers or uh, like the Paradise Paper. It gives you more impact. I mean, when Le Monde, The Guardian, New York Times uh, is getting a story out on the same day, of course, everybody will speak about the story. So it's becoming something huge. And it's uh, what we wanted for, uh, for the Daphne project and the other project. We also, by this way of working, we want to send uh, an important signal to enemies of the press. We want to say, well, okay, if you kill the, the messenger, you won't kill the message. I mean, what's the point in killing one journalist or getting after one journalist if by this, after, I mean, you, you have 30 or 40 journalists uh, getting after you. So this was the, yeah, the, the principle behind, uh, behind the forbidden stories. The, one of the other reasons for collaborating is that because often, the stories are global, so we need to have people all around the world to do the fact-checking, to have sources and uh, to identify um, perhaps the, the money trail and, and where the money goes. So it's very important for us to, yeah, to be stronger while uh, collaborating. One of, um, one, the other example of, of I would like to give you today is Green Blood. And when I speak about transnational and global story, Green, green Blood is about um, uh, is is really the, the great example. It's our second project actually, and it was released in June. Um, green Blood was the idea that when we started to focus on seeing where I mean who were the journalists uh, that were threatened in the world and what they were doing, we discovered that many journalists that had problems and that were arrested in the world were investigating environmental stories. So we decided to focus a little bit on what they were doing. And when we started working on this, we discovered that uh, many of them were uh, actually doing stories on mining industries. And we discovered that in three different countries, actually, Tanzania, uh, Guatemala, and India, uh, journalists had been killed all or arrested because they were uh, investigating uh, mining industries, and they didn't know about e each other. So uh, we decided to tell the stories of, or of these three countries with the Green Blood project that was uh, edited uh, in June with uh, the same partners. So <coughs> the Green Blood project published, uh, was published by 37 news organizations worldwide. You have their names here. Um, Le Monde, The Guardian, uh, El País, Expresso, Die Zeit. And um, there is a, a film on this collaboration that is going to be uh, broadcast in public TV in first semester 2020 uh, to explain how we worked on it. And yeah, just perhaps a, a trailer to give you an idea. Writing about his uh, involvement.
clandestinamente. Para la compañía, para las autoridades, yo era una amenaza. na rushwa ni wadudu wabaya katika maendeleo yale ya sekta kwa sababu they have money It's about uh, finishing the work of um, assassinated or under threat reporters. How many men were involved in this raping? Sita, wakati mgini wa muata wa nane. Oh, export details. La policía disparó o no contra los manifestantes. No se sabe oficialmente. So yeah, this is this gives you an idea of the way we work, uh, how we try to divide the work because some of the people, uh, some of the journalists you you see here. Uh, Jonathan Watts from The Guardian, he wa went to uh, Tanzania. Um, there were other people uh, from the Expresso news, uh, Portugal, uh, Portuguese newspaper who was in Guatemala. I mean, everybody has uh, specialized in one country and did some uh, um, uh, work and, and reports there. And the, the, the starting point was, uh, uh, you've seen the case of Jagan Singh. he's a Indian journalist, he was burned alive because he was investigating actually sun mafias. And we discovered that around mining industries, there were a lot of corruption, money, um, and usually yeah, corrupted politicians, uh, violence, and powerful organization able uh, and capable of, or, uh, I mean, wanting to kill a, a journalist. So. Uh, we, we want to confront those powerful organizations and um, we also wanted to trace back the, actually, uh, the, the orid, I mean, we wanted to see what was getting out of the mine and, and where it was uh, sold because uh, it was important for us to work on the supply chain and to show that these stories were not only local stories but global stories. For example, in Tanzania, uh, we're investigating a gold mine and there was a lot of violence around this gold mine, um, rapes, uh, many, um, um, I mean, people getting killed and the one of the main buyers of, of this gold was selling its gold to uh, actually big Silicon Valley uh, companies, uh, Google, Amazon, other companies and for us it was also important to be able to trace back this the supply chain and to go and ask the companies and confront them confront them with the evidence we have found and we could not have done this without our uh, network and without the resources that can bring you journalists from all around the world uh, so this is uh, yeah this was a an important story for us and um, being able to fact check some uh, some information, calling each other and um, being able to uh, to find some uh, resources uh, from from the Guardian and and from other newspapers was was really huge. Um, I in in this project we also work in collaboration with one Indian journalist um, on the Indian uh, file. Uh, her name was Sandhya Ravishankar and she decided to help us because she was threatened to 
And I just wanted to yeah, uh, let her speak for a while because she helped us a lot in this investigation and she is the one who take the, the risks on the, on the ground. Yep. I don't know if we hear. Initially, it started slow. There were just press releases of, um, from the miners and their associations stating that I had taken bribes from the rival miners. Um, my mobile number was put out on social media and then I got a whole heap of calls uh, from people threatening to rape me. And then there were a couple of uh, defamation cases that are ongoing. Um, I don't think that's ever going to end. Uh, the miners have openly declared that they have five detective agents following me everywhere I go and my name is part of an official uh, report of the government of India uh, stating that I'm somebody who has enmity with the minor and in a very slanderous manner. So, so the basic point that I'm trying to make is that this is a very difficult investigation. I'm the only person writing about this because it's a, you know, it's a bomb. So uh, Sandhya actually was doing, I mean, is doing uh, what uh, Jagan Singh was doing, but Jagan Singh was burned alive and, and Sadia is still going on. And we invited her in Paris for the first meeting when we launched the project. Um, it's really important for us to associate uh, all the local journalists working on those stories um, and to show them that we are also here to protect them and to help them on the ground. For example, Sandia couldn't go uh, in some places in India because uh, she, she, she really takes big risks there and she helped us find the good places and she actually uh, been in Brussels a few weeks ago and she was really relieved that a group of journalists of, I mean, 38 journalists uh, in the world helped her on this investigation and she feels now stronger. It, it was really a question at the beginning, you know, you don't know if you put people in danger while deciding to work on, on those kinds of story. And we had those kinds of discussion with Sandhya and at, I mean at the end and, and now a few months after uh, the publication of the story, uh, Sandhya really uh, is feeling safer and she has the support of all the journalists of the project, of the European Commission that has been inviting her and uh, it's a relief for us to see that it can work uh, like this. Um, yeah, from the gold mines to the Silicon Valley, this is the, what I was explaining to you about the importance of being transnational. I don't think today's interests and companies, uh, I mean, have no borders. So journalists should not have borders anymore and should work together to try to build a case because the cases are no more local or national, but they are becoming really transnational. Um, actually, I wanted, didn't want to make it too long to answer your questions about uh, forbidden stories and uh, I wanted to th thank uh, Arish and the French Embassy uh, that is sponsoring my, uh, my visit here. I was very, uh, very touched and honored to meet a lot of you uh, during those two past days and uh, I hope if you want to discuss with me, feel free to come after the session to have any conversation. Uh, the end. But the question is, who measures the threat? If I'm pursuing a story for a person who was killed or who was threatened, but this means that I myself am going to be killed eventually. Who decides that? Who measures the risk? What are the criteria? We have a, a, a protocol on security. We really, I think security is the key for us. So we really have a very um, a great protocol on security and we discuss a lot before launching any investigation. We discuss a lot with the journalist to see what kind of, uh, if, if our investigation ha can put him in danger. For example, two weeks ago, I was visiting a journalist who had to leave her country because she had some pressure. And the, the whole point of our discussion was to see she had big, big threats in her country. And actually, it was, she thinks it was one politician in her country who ordered her assassination. 
and we wanted to investigate this. Uh, and she wants, and she's happy, we're going to investigate this, but she put some uh, conditions, and <laughs> we will respect those conditions. So we never decide to uh, focus on a story without being in contact with the journalist or his relatives uh, or her relatives. We really uh, try to, I mean, we have a very strong pro security protocol. Uh, we, we defined and we can adapt as well. We were all investigative journalists, so we know how to communicate in a safe way. Uh, I think the fact that we are a number of journalists brings some protection. But as I said, we are not a bulletproof jacket. And I mean, if a journalist was killed because of the story and if the person who ordered the killing is still in liberty, uh, there is a great chance it's, uh, it's a bit touchy to uh, pursue the, the work he was doing. So uh, you, we only choose one or two big stories a year because we cannot do more and we try to put the most resources we can on those stories and we try to choose the stories without, uh, without endangering the journalist or his family. So all this is a big brainstorm before starting an investigation. Actually, for Don Bowles, it, the investigation uh, was not an investigation today. It was an investiga investigation in 1976. Uh, actually, it, it's not something we did today. It's at that time when he was uh, murdered in his car bombing, just a few weeks after the um, journalist who decided to pursue his investigation. And it's not something that happened uh, uh, yeah, years later, no. Thanks. Um, I have two questions, if I can. Um, I want, could you talk a bit more about how you interact and use local journalists? Um, and were, for example, Guatemalan, Indian, Tanzanian media involved? Did they publish stories as well so that the local populations could read about what happened? Uh, and uh, also, who, who pays for who pays for it? Do the New York Times pay for their journalists to come and get involved? Or are you funded and do you fund just that, that we're relationship? Funded. Uh, we are a, we are a non-profit organization, so we, we have donors. Um, with the partners we are working uh, with, actually, they're usually journalists working in big newspapers and, I mean, they're paid by their uh, publications. So, for example, we're working with a journalist called Anne-Michel from Le Monde and Anne-Michel, she specialized in Le Monde for doing only the collaborative stories. So she is working for ICIG, for example. Uh, she works with us, she works with other uh, collaborative platforms. So now I think the big newspapers, they have one journalist or more sometimes that are really specialized in collaborative journalism. Uh, we are working with um, Mikael Pereira from Expresso, uh, and he's the one also working with ICIG. So those, those journalists, I mean, they're paid, they're paid by their uh, newspapers. And sometimes we work f with uh, uh, freelancers, and of course we pay them in this case. Uh, I mean, we, we pay the freelancer we work with. Um, yeah, this is for the money question. And the other question was about yeah, the local journalists, of course. For each of those stories, we collaborated with a, a local journalist. So, for example, uh, in Tanzania, Tanzania is very—it's a very difficult uh, country. Con I mean, when it's related to uh, press freedom, so it was very difficult for us to find somebody in Tanzania ready to work with us because actually, there is this journalist we you saw uh, quickly in the teaser, but. Uh, I mean, the journalist were working, uh, was working on in corruption and the newspapers he was working for were closed. So we collaborated with the Kenyan journalist and even the Kenyan journalist preferred to stay anonymous. So uh, often it's very difficult to find partners that would publish in the countries we're investigating in because it's a very 
touchy countries when it comes to f uh, press, press freedom. Um, in Guatemala, we also collaborated with a, a journalist, a local journalist uh, called Carlos Schock. And uh, Carlos Schock, he was actually, he had a lawsuit against him uh, from the firm he was working on. So it was a bit difficult during our investigation because uh, he was actually living in, um, I mean, he was hiding from, uh, from the police. He was afraid of being arrested. Uh, I think things are quite better for him now. But yeah, we have to deal with all, all of this kind of uh, uh, problems on the ground. And, and our main goal is, of course, uh, protecting the local journalists we work for. Sometimes it's good, like for Sandia, to show their work because they agree on it. And uh, sometimes they just prefer to stay uh, low profile. Thank you. I don't know if you have any other questions. <laughs> I hope it was because things were clear. And I'm, I don't have Wi-Fi right now, but uh, I would advise you to go on our website. Uh, there are many videos. We all come from um, uh, all the investigative journalists working for Forbidden Stories have a background in, in broadcast and TV investigation. So we try to yeah, edit some short videos to show how we work and to make the investigation uh, simple. We did some videos sometimes wh when we don't have time to uh, investigate uh, a case uh, during month. Um, we, we just publish a small video on our website and put it on the uh, social networks. Um, this is what we did for two journalists, Mexican journalists, uh, who, I mean, who were um, killed in, in Mexico uh, a few years ago, a journalist called Javier Valdez. He was a very famous journalist, uh, and he was killed in Mexico in 2017. Uh, in Mexico, it's, uh, it's known now that actually one journalist die every month almost. This is uh, just an average number, but there are already more than 10 journalists uh, that have been killed since the beginning of the year in Mexico. And so we did some small videos on actually three Mexican journalists, uh, Miroslava Bridge, Javier Valdez and Cecilio Penada, uh, who were both, I mean, who were, uh, who, who were both of them were investiga investigating uh, corruption stories. And uh, Javier Valdez was probably the victim of some cartel war. Um, but he, he became the symbol of, uh, of victims, uh, journalist victims in, in Mexico two years ago. And I mean, many journalists have to, have to leave today. I, I don't know if you followed what happened in Mexico right now, but it's quite frightening. The, the police try to stop the son of El Chapo, uh, El Chapo, the big uh, kingpin, uh, who was arrested in, in uh, there was a trial in, in a few months ago in the States. So his son was arrested a few weeks ago. Uh, El Chapito, and uh, actually there are hundreds of uh, people from the gangs arriving in the city where he was arrested, and the police at the end has had to release him uh, because there was too much pressure from the gangs, too much, uh, too many dead people, and so after he was released, they started killing policemen. Um, there are more than 12 policemen that have been killed uh, after this arrest. Uh, and the cartel was just, they were just getting revenge. So, and they do the same thing with journalists. I mean, they don't care. <laughs> Some journalists write something about them in the, in the newspapers and they just decide they send someone to, to kill him. So yeah, it's important to see what's happening all around the world, either in Africa, uh, Latin America, uh, Middle of Europe, uh, Middle East, um, and uh, yeah, uh, stories about journalists say a lot uh, about the political situation as well. So we find it's, it's quite a symbol to, to pursue tho those stories.
So um, how do you decide which story to work on? Do you wait for um, the journalist or the relative of the journalist or the news organization where the journalist is working to approach you or do you make the first contact or how does it exactly work? A uh, very good question actually. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit both. We created a safe box on our website um, and we are all reachable um, on security, by, I mean security messaging services. So if a journalist wants to send us a story or if he feels threatened, he can uh, send the story on the safe box. For the moment, we didn't, I mean, we didn't work like this because when we, were, when we started to, to work, this w there was this uh, Daphne case and we thought it was really uh, important to, to work on, the, on this case. We, and Daphne's son was a journalist, so we had an access to all what Daphne was writing about and he, uh, he also collaborated with, with us. Uh, for the Green Greenblatt project, uh, actually, it's us investigating who decided that uh, doing some transversal uh, story on environment was really uh, worth. So it really depends, but of course, if somebody uh, feels threatened, he can contact us. We we cannot deal with all the stories, so sometimes we we are not the good target. We prefer. Uh, I mean, to tell him to go and see RSF or some other organization. Uh, sometimes we can put him in contact with other people and, and trying to create a network. Yeah, the problem is we have to make choices and we cannot deal with all the stories uh, journalists were, were working on. Hello. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> I'm Ahmed Baider, national CFI national coordinator in Yemen. I was just wondering, it, it, it's a website now, and and you publish articles that belongs to journalists only, or or other articles. I, I mean, can, can you just explain? Yeah. I, I'm sorry, maybe I arrived we're late, so I did not understand the concept course. itself. Uh, no, of Thank course, you. it's a it's a new model. Actually, we we are a platform. We, we are not supposed to publish. We have a website because uh, we want to, to I mean, communicate about what we're doing. But we, we are not the, I mean, we are not the publishers of the of the story. The publishers, they are, I mean, Le Monde, The Guardian, wow. El País. This is the people we're working with, and they are the one who are publishing the stories. So we just create the network. We supervise the organization. We do the coordination. Uh, we have a first meeting, usually we have a first meeting in Paris, sometimes a second meeting, when we all see each other. It's always better to see each other and not, all, all, not only to organize calls. So we see each other, we divide the work. Some journalists decide, for, decide to work on, on some part of the story. Uh, it, it was like this for the Daphne project, for the um, uh, Green Blood project, some uh, reporters decided to focus on Tanzania, others on India. We divide the work, then we stay in touch uh, with Signal. We decide of a publication uh, time. So, for example, uh, for uh, Green Blood, it was June. It's very complicated to find a good publication date because actually <laughs> some have local elections. I don't know if, if you uh, want to do a collaboration published in March. Uh, it's very complicated for in France because you will have like uh, uh, local elections. So we ha you have to think of this and organize this a long time before. You work in secrecy, and, uh, and then everybody publish the same time. So we're not the publisher. We, we have stories on our website, but we are, of course, we're not as known as the other big newspapers. So some of the newspapers decide just to republish the stories we're doing. But most of them, they write their own stories. So, 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 so you are an organization that helps journalists, you know, to find the right way. With no, let's say. we really, uh, we really decide to work together on an investigation. It's okay. it's like the Panama Papers, but the difference is that uh, the Panama Papers had a leak at the beginning. Okay. Uh, and this is how uh, I mean, this is why collaborative journalists became so popular because of the leaks. Because for with the leaks, like you had uh, 
big quantity of data, you didn't know how to deal with it, and so you decided that uh, you were working with uh, journalists from all over the world because some of them were taking part of a small part of the leaks, and uh, w you divided the work like this. For us, uh, the beginning of the story is not a leak. Is 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 the, I mean, the story of a journalist who who has been silenced, and we think. I mean, collaborative journalism it's, is not only about leaks, but has, an, uh, uh, I mean, has meaning outside leaks. So this is why we believe in, in this way of working. I don't know if this exists in, uh, actually. Uh, we have uh, Middle Eastern newspapers or organization that belong to ICIJ, but do you have the same model here? In, in, in the Middle East or uh, of collaborative platforms? Yeah, uh, Arid is, is but Ari uh Like, uh, I think uh, through Arid they do this kind of collaborative uh, uh, investigative journalism. And yeah, so d by the way, uh, uh, do you do anything, some, uh, I mean, I'm, because I'm from Yemen, do you do anything related to Yemen? Because if we say about investigative journalism, I believe my country will be the best thing to investigate because it's full of corruption and war and whatever. Uh, do you do something? Are you interested? Like, uh, I mean, this is like a personal question as French journalist. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you mean as a French journalist or as, uh, or as forbidden stories? Uh, well, uh, forbidden stories will be nice. I mean, because our, our country is forbidden now. <laughs> no, yeah. they, they don't let journalists in, which is forbidden. It's a war crime. No journalists, no visas were issued since last May for journalists. So, so as a forbidden story, it would be very. Is, uh, don't you have an eye for future? Thank one you. of the key, you know, uh, of of our work is uh, a secret. I mean, we will never say what we are working on because uh, this is already putting somebody in danger. So you, we never, we, we will never, I will never tell you what I'm working on right now. And I can not tell you when the meeting is going to take place, when the publication is going to take place, I mean 2020, 2021, end of the year. I mean, I really, this is the, the, the key principle uh, for forbidden story and for collaborative platforms like this. Um, I don't know what the ICIG is working on right now. And I have friends in the ICIG, so I'm trying hard, and they would never tell. So this is the key. Of course, I mean, uh, Yemen is a, is a very big story, and I know French journalists work on Yemen, and, and I mean, uh, investigative French journalists, many of them work on, on Yemen and on uh, wep weapons health to Yemen as well. So, I mean, uh, these are important stories, and I won't tell you it's, it's not of the interest of forbidden story, but yeah, I would never tell you. you can, we can speak uh, later of what's happening in Yemen, and I would be uh, very interested to, to speak with you to have the background of everything, but uh, yeah, secrecy is the, <laughs> it is, is the key. I would have uh, prepared other videos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if uh, if you have no questions. I mean, we can speak later, uh, face to face, if you want to. Or uh, I wish Laurent would uh, Laurent Richard uh, would be here because he's the one who. Uh, really was at the key, uh, I mean, at the origin of the project and his profile is very interesting because he is a, a famous investigative journalist and he was in, um, actually, uh, in the close, very close in the same building uh, than the journalists of Charlie Hebdo uh, who were killed in France. Uh, and I think this, <laughs> what happened, he was the first one to actually, before the, the policemen, before uh, the firemen arrived on the site of Charlie Hebdo, Laurent Richard was just the desk close to, to them. And he was the first with uh, some other to, to get, I mean, inside Charlie Hebdo and to try to help who was still living. So I think this was uh, really important for him uh, in, in the beginning of this story 
because yeah, he. I think after the, uh, this, the, the trauma was big, but he wanted to make something for uh, for other journalists. And there was another thing that was very important in uh, in his career, and I think it was at the origin of Forbidden Stories as well. It was him doing a story on Azerbaijan and discover how Azerbaijan was trying to actually uh, buy some politicians even in France and how they were doing this. He called this La Diplomatie du Caviar. Uh, and uh, he was in Azerbaijan and he met there a fantastic journalist, investigative journalist. Uh, and she, she took so many risks and I think this, I mean he was, he was released after being detained a few hours but she was staying and living there and she was living so much pressure and, and she was so brave. Uh, uh, this, this meeting with this journalist really changed his, uh, uh, I think his view of the, uh, what, uh, what needed to be really uh, done uh, as, a, as a journalist. So yeah, he, he, he's a great guy. Uh, you can find a little bit of his biography on the website. And he managed to convince like more than 15 organizations all around the world and the most pre prestigious investigative journalists to uh, yeah, go on board with him uh, to do those, those stories. Uh, who, uh, how do you get the stories? Just like in Daphne's uh, case, how do you know she was working on this uh, and she is like in this point and the name of the guy? Who gives you the data? And uh, I think some of the journalists, like, uh, when they are working on some really dangerous stories, they hide that and they don't uh, even keep the documents in their computers or other things. So. How do you decide that we're going to continue on this story? And who give you the, the data to continue the work? And did you have any time to start from zero? Actually, in the case of Daphne, Caruana Galizia, uh, the, there was a very strong connection with Matthew Caruana, her son. Uh, Matthew Caruana was at the time a um, member of the ICIJ. He was working in France uh, and very close to Laurent's office. And of course, when this happened and when Laurent decided to take over the investigation, Mathieu helped us a lot. So we had uh, privileged access to uh, the investigation Daphne was working on. In the case, so this was, yeah, I mean, this was a particular case. But in the case of Green Blood, for example, it was interesting because we, it, it was not close, it was not a very close story. We arrived some, uh, some time after his death, I mean, the, the Indian journalist. And uh, very strangely, for example, we approached the family and we asked for the laptop of, of Jagandra. And the family had the laptop. We didn't think this was even possible. I, I mean, we thought that after the investigation, and uh, the, the we won't find anything. But we had the laptop of the Jagandra, and inside the laptop we find many evidence we found that uh, Jagandra was uh, uh, um, registering all his conversations. So we found conversation he had with some of his sources. And we could really build all the investigation. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the, the we're doing a journalist, m journalist work in, in this sense that we, we go and get the evidence and try to, to yeah, go to the really root of the, of the, st of the case. It is actually very, uh, the, the Green Broad project is very interesting but because even in very uh, remote countries and uh, w we really made some huge findings. So for the case of Jagandra Singh, he, he, he's the journalist, Indian journalist you see at the beginning of the video who was burned alive. We found uh, actually, uh, I mean, th with those conversation, we really had a clear idea of who could have ordered his assassination and with the help of whom we found one of the policemen who was present when Jagandra uh, was burned. So it's actually a policeman who was there at that moment. We managed to identify the policeman 
and we really uh, managed to go very far in the investigation uh, on Jagandra, Jagandra murder. So y yeah, e even when it's far, even when it's complicated, uh, we, we've, we have really great findings and, and we managed to tell something new about the story. I hope you found this, you found it interesting. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask in Arabic. Can I? Yes, of course. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Throughout your work, uh, have you faced uh, the idea that you want to protect the source, but you have to not to protect the source, but to say the source of the information, but you should protect them at the same time. And uh, tell me about this difficulty. How did you solve this uh, as a journalist or as a journalist? As a, uh, as a journalist, I mean, you always have this kind of question, but the, I mean, the, the, the for a journalist, the priority is the source, it's the protection of the source. So, I mean, if you feel that a source can be compromised, you you will never, uh, you will never go further. As and as forbidden stories, I mean, the 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 protection of the people we're working for and, and with is just the the top top priority. So we'll never take any risk compromising a source. And sometimes we have to we have to decide not to do a story because the source doesn't want. It. It's the case of this journalist I, I was visi visited some weeks ago. Like she was, she had big, big threatens in her own countries and uh, probably a politician ordering her, her, her murder. And I mean, the story was, is amazing from a journalistic point of view, but without her agreement, I cannot do the story because I, I she feels threatened by, by this guy. I cannot push her and convince her that it's great to have 30 journalists working on, on the story because uh, I mean, and I would do probably the same than her. She, 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 she feels in danger. So we always have to, yeah, balance everything before decided to, to do a story. Thank you very much for your uh, time and your interest in Forbidden Story. Thank you again to the French Embassy, <laughs> uh, my sponsor, and yeah, don't hesitate to come and see me later, discuss around the coffee. <laughs>